We will be recording this session. And if you're live here in the Oak Room, we ask that you please silence your cell phones. And so let's get underway. Uh, good morning, Ellen, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think the presentation today is because I, um, uh, I really wanted Angela to do something on Spanish culture um, during the Franco regime. And this presentation addresses that issue. Um, it offers a view of Spanish culture and society during the dictatorship of Francisco Franco. And it uses examples of cultural productions in literature, film, photographs, et cetera, produced during and also after the dictatorship to trace the changes that occurred in Spanish society from the years of famine, exile, and international isolation to the tourist boom and rapid industrial development. And the tourist boom was quite amazing when you think of the dictatorship that lasted for so long under Franco. Um, so with that introduction, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Angela. All right, thank you. Buenos dias a todos. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me again. I'm excited to um, share from this. This is um, near and dear to me because I just gave a class on Spanish culture during the dictatorship. So um, I was working with my students all last semester on these topics um, and um, looking into different cultural production. So that, that'll be the focus of today, but I'll also go over the more historical side of things and how things changed over the, the course of the 40 year dictatorship. All right, so um, I'll introduce myself again, and I added a little bit about my dissertation um, topic, if you're interested, since it's from this time period. So I'm a PhD candidate in Iberian studies at The Ohio State University. I um, grew up in Gainesville. I attended the IB program at Eastside High School. I then went on to study at Smith College, where I um, have a degree in English and Spanish. And now I am just one step away from completing my PhD by completing the dissertation. I've done archival research trips to Spain in 2016 and 2019 and hope to get back soon um, in different libraries and archives are in the capital of Madrid as well as in Malaga in the south. Um, as an instructor, I've taught introductory Spanish language courses, Spanish composition courses, and um, Spanish culture under Francoism, which is the latest course that I've taught. Um, and as for my research, I researched 20th century Spanish writers, especially women writers and poets. So I wanted to share a little bit about my dissertation project since again, it's from this time period. So I work with early 20th century um, literature, particularly from the 1920s, 30s and 40s and kind of tracing their artistic development during the cultural effervescence that was the second Spanish Republic that we talked about last week. So looking particularly at the 20s and 30s and then how writing during the 40s and into the 50s changed um, post, post um, war and post um, World War II, right? Um, so my project works with a collection of homages, homages to different writers, be that events, newspaper articles, other sorts of performances that establish the legacy of the literary canon. Unfortunately, this legacy is very much focused on 10 male poets. Um, and so my goal, as is the goal of many other scholars at this time, is to bring more women writers into the conversation as being viable um, contenders for being belonging in this, these groups for, for going to the same um, their tulias or, or um, gatherings as the men did um, for, for being within the same social spheres, but they haven't been talked about as much. So there's a great documentary um, called Sin, La Sin Sombrero, the, the women without hats, um, who were the, the pioneer women of the time in the different arts and cultural movements. And they actually have a three, three documentaries, um, starting with more um, of the well-known um, literary um, icons that we know of and moving towards those who um, were lesser known and those who went into exile. So I just have on this next page, um, just to kind of keep in mind that while all of this, this history is happening, these are people who are just um, at this time in their late twenties, early thirties, um, really getting setting out on a journey to become poets by, putting, uh, by publishing their first poetry collections in the late 1920s. And so this event that, that you see here on this screen is um, 
a very well-known picture. It's from the homage to the Baroque poet Luis de Góngora on the 300th anniversary of his death in Seville, Spain. So they went to the uh, Ateneo or Atheneum of Seville to, to gather to celebrate his work, which hadn't been talked about as much in the preceding decades, um, and also share their own um, poetry and, and um, artistic experiences. But of course, as you see in the photo, they're all men. And um, you see from the second from left is um, Federico Garcia Lorca. The man with the, um, the goggle-like glasses is Emilio Prados. Um, Damaso Alonso is second from right. So a lot of really well-known um, men participated in events like these. And so I'm kind of thinking about how we will we'll celebrate the centennial of this event in just a few years in 2027 and how we will um, also recognize the women that were there as well. So that's what I'm doing for my dis dissertation project and for the presentation. So, and keep in mind, these were people who went into exile or were even still in Spain during this time period, um, active in Spanish cultural scenes for over 50 years. So for today, I'll first talk about the chronology of the Franco dictatorship in terms of its development and politics from 1939 until Franco's death in 1975. And then I'll move into Spanish culture through the decades with a few examples from the course I taught. And finally, um, talk a little bit about the aftermath of the dictatorship, followed by a question and answer session. All right, so, so we'll begin with kind of the historical context. And, and typically, you know, there's a lot of debate as to when the transition to democracy happened at the end of the dictatorship, but the dates you see, 1939 being the end of the war um, and Franco's victory parade of in April of 1939 until late 1975 are kind of seen as um, the relative, um, uh, the timeline of the dictatorship, but of course it had um, its aftermath continues into the present day. Um, I wanted to share with you um, a short snippet from the, the course that I taught. This is from my syllabus. Um, I taught Spanish 4564, Spanish culture during Francoism at Ohio State. It's an upper level um, Spanish culture course designed for um, students late in the major, graduating seniors. Um, and we teach this course in Spanish using these Spanish texts. So my course seeks to offer a panoramic view of Spanish culture and society during the dictatorship of Francisco Franco. The course will mainly focus on our cultural production, such as literature, film, music, television, as representations of the historical, social, political, and economic experiences that were lived in Spain during that period. And it's really important for us to look not just at the politics or what Franco was doing, um, but rather what were everyday people experiencing? How were they expressing themselves? What um, cultural productions were created by the regime itself? Right, because this is a this is a long time period. Multiple generations had to deal with living during the war and dictatorship, and it's something that again has lasting effects today. So um, we study in the course, and I'll share with you today um, cultural productions produced during the the Franco regime, as well as those created in contemporary times. And some of the um, issues we focused on were gender roles, the years of famine, international isolation and autarky, repression and exile, the tourist boom censorship and Franco's ideology. So we basically move forward in time, focusing on some of these key issues throughout the semester. All right, so we'll begin um, the chronology with the post-war post Spain. So what, um, getting um, back to what the, the war itself, what was happening um, as the war came to an end, right? So these post-war years are roughly from 1939 until, um, uh, the the um, World War II end in 1945. So the end of the war kind of more or less moves into a kind of different part of the regime. So these hunger years um, were very brutal. These were, in terms of life and death, the most brutal years of the regime for a number of reasons. Um, as you'll recall, many Spaniards that by the thousands had to um, leave Spain and go into exile. Um, many became prisoners and many were um, executed in the years um, of the of, in the immediate aftermath of the war. Um, some other things that were affecting everybody essentially were, were the cities that were destroyed by the bombs, right? The bombing um, was really brutal. Um, there's a lot of pictures, especially from propaganda posters during the war that we took a look at that the whole buildings were destroyed, parts of buildings destroyed, um, things just weren't livable anymore in cities. Um, also droughts didn't make things easier, um, so harvests were, were much more sparse. 
And you'll remember too that the war was fought in trenches. The trenches um, and all of the fighting tore up the soil in Spain, tore up the land, um, destroyed farms. So that was certainly a cause of um, lack of food and, and resources. And ultimately international isolationism, which continued into the 50s, um, uh, set forth by Franco was a terrible, um, had terrible consequences for again, the lack of resources, economic um, uh, difficulties and things of that nature. So I wanted um, to include a couple of statistics that I found in a book that I, I use, because I think it's kind of helpful to, to visualize just how things shifted, um, how things were destroyed and, and um, not repaired during the, the first years of the of post-war Spain. So there were originally 3,200 taxis in Madrid prior to the war to, to transport people. And there was also a metro that started in the um, 1920s. We've, we recently have celebrated the centennial of the metro system, but only 400 of those over 3,000 taxis remained, right? Cars were destroyed. Um, the city was in bad shape. Um, also, it's interesting that um, for, for crimes related to, um, to the, the sparsity and, and poverty, fines increased for things like reselling gasoline, a whopping 5,000 pesetas, serving food in a restaurant after regular hours. I thought this was really interesting, 3,000 pesetas. Um, in one of the books that we read, there was a scene in which the young woman goes to a restaurant and the restaurant itself is really struggling. They don't have enough food to feed people. Um, all of these people are, are close to starving and she eats this soup that really is not much more substantial than water and has just kind of been um, colored with turmeric to make it look like it's something. The annual salary varied a lot. Um, and keep in mind too, there were many unemployed people, um, many heads of households, the men um, may have been killed during this time or soon after. Um, it was not safe to be um, a Republican sympathizer at all. So um, the annual salary, started around 2,750 pesetas for being a telegram operator and went upwards of 30,000 um, if you were something like a military captain. Um, rationing cards, which I'll show you on another slide. Um, these were, this was the key means of survival at the time. So rationing cards began in May of 1939 um, and they were used by everyone and anyone. Um, if you were a groom getting married, you, you got 2,500 pesetas for your rationing card and 5,000 if you were a bride willing to stop working. As you can imagine, the dictatorship and regime really encouraged women to be um, traditional in their um, role in the household and having children, uh, especially due to the loss of life during the war. That was really important um, for them to revitalize the nation. So on the right of your screen, you'll see an um, example of a rationing car with the little stamps and everything. Um, so, so what do we, what is, what does autarky mean when we think of the autarky of the 1940s and 50s? So autarky refers to Spanish economic self-sufficiency and cultural isolationism. This means again, not reaching for help from other nations. During World War II, Franco um, did send troops as volunteers, but um, afterwards they, they were cut off from really getting um, aid from the, the countries that supported them. Um, and, and so they weren't, they weren't financially be, keeping stability. And also culturally, this was a big, um, big part of it too, if we think moving towards the tourist years, right? Spain um, blocked itself off from the rest of the world. People weren't traveling to other countries unless they were leaving the country. Um, and so they really kind of tried to, to consolidate their own national culture. Um, and we'll see that with, the, with what, they, what they told school children at the time. Rationing cards in the black market were, were everywhere. Um, and it's important to note that both work, wealthy and working class families alike relied on the black market for necessities, up to 80% of all needs. These are people who may have spent the, the three years of the war in bunkers or in their homes um, with very little to eat. Um, many many um, who survived the period uh, talked about legumes and these um, that they had to eat again and again um, and just not having um, the ability to feed oneself during in, in a war zone for those who remained in Madrid. Those who had things like shops were in a little better shape and would um, increase their prices substantially during that time, but they, at the end of the day, it, the war just per, um, persisted for so many years that it, it affected everybody. Um, so what else about the dictatorship? As a whole, I'm um, looking more towards the oppressive, oppressive side of the regime. Um, 
There was savage persecution and blanket discrimination of the vanquished, those who were defeated, right? And the strong rhetoric around the nationalists being the ones who were the winners, the true Spain, et cetera. So this idea by the regime that they're purging of a national body, that the politics as a pathology, that they need to get rid of um, those who, who supported the Republicans, right? Um, this led to over half a million people being in prisons in concentration camps in Spain. Many also who had escaped to France ended up in concentration camps on the coast of Spain or during World War II um, or forced labor. Um, there was a strong sense that one could redeem oneself through work. Um, so forced labor was key in the construction of things like the, um, the, the large cross for the Valle de los Caídos, the Valley of the Fallen. Um, and there were also daily executions. This was a very common occurrence. All of these to really crack down on the population and gain control in a very short period of time. Um, so these first years from 1939 to around 1945 were one of the most um, severe. Not to say that people weren't imprisoned and, and executed later, as many were in prison for decades, but, but this was kind of the, the worst point of it in terms of numbers of people. Um, and you see on the right side of the screen, um, pictures of the Modelo prison from Barcelona, um, where many were held. Uh, and you see too in the, in the interior picture, you see on the wall, it says Viva España, Arriba España, and it has Franco's name on there. So all of these slogans of um, long live Spain, um, Upward Spain. I don't have a really good translation for that, but those are those are the some of the key slogans. Um, and the prison itself was designed as what's called a panopticon, um, where the central portion is where um, the guards would be, and they would look into these different spokes and could see the prisoners. So you never really knew if anyone was looking at you. It was another way of control. And this prison actually existed for over a century and didn't close until a few years ago. Um, it was still being used under democratic times, although. Um, uh, you know, the, the slogans and things were removed. And also to recall for this time period, so Franco just survives the defeat of the Axis in World War II and remains largely in power until his death in 1945, largely thanks to United States support, um, particularly by the presidents um, during these, these years. Um, and I have that on another slide. So some of the characteristics of the regime, right? How, how did it last so long? Why do we call it Francoism or Franquismo specifically? Um, so it's called uh, um, El Régimen Franquista or Franquismo because it's named for Franco. That's really kind of the one unifying factor of the regime. There was no homogenous ideology. Of course, it was very oppressive um, and led to, to measures to um, curtail people's movements, to um, keep women in the home and things like that. But there was no really solid ideology that you could point to because it shifted a lot. Um, so in, in spite of that, what held things together was Franco as the figurehead, as the head of state. And he was the only head of state um, during this time period. And I'll talk a little bit about too, um, the, the choosing a successor um, in the 70s. He obtained power and support from a couple different um, groups that also supported him during the war. Um, so the Falange, the um, fascist party. Um, and, and, you know, we call it a fascist party, but it's kind of Spain's own brand of authoritarian um, government. It's, it's not quite um, the same as um, Mussolini's Italy or Hitler's um, Germany, right? Um, he also received power from the Catholic Church, um, it's especially from the Opus Dei, which is a um, Catholic organization that was very much aligned with the dictatorship. And of course, the military, as well as the monarchy. Um, uh, so his goal was to maintain power for as long as possible. And in doing so, the regime adapted to the circumstances. That's why we see um, uh, serious um, oppression and, and um, executions at the beginning, only to be followed a few decades later by women being able to wear bikinis on the beach. So again, adapting to the circumstances to survive for the duration of his life. Um, it's also known for its Catholic traditionalism. The, the nation of Spain is, is very much connected to the Catholic church. Um, and this was a means by which the clergy were able to control the population. They were the ones, um, not, just, not just there when people went to church, but for, for their children when they're in school, the clergy taught children, um, forced them to sing um, the anthem of the, the dictatorship, the Cara al Sol, head towards the sun. Um, 
and also would control women as part of the um, women's group, the Seccion Femenina. There were also no political parties or constitution at this time. The constitution from the Second Spanish Republic from 1931 um, was no longer in use. Um, that original constitution allowed for things like divorce and women's suffrage, um, which were, were replaced by what's called orders of the leyes fundamentales del reino. So they're, they're um, basically direct orders from Franco that were written up. A lot of them pertain to things like work um, and industry. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the propaganda side of things. So building legitimacies, um, Franco's ideology and propaganda. So one of the main things that they, they needed to do to consolidate power to uh, maintain this narrative that they are the true Spain is to change the narrative of the Spanish Civil War. And this one key thing is the reason why many Spaniards who survived um, and may have been supporting the Republicans or against the regime couldn't speak out or didn't feel they were able to speak out for so long because there was so much of, a, of an effort to, um, to get rid of any lasting Republicans, to not talk about them, to only see the war and the coup as a national rising, an alzamiento nacional, saving Spain from, from communist Masonic conspiracy of the anti-Spain. Um, moreover, the Spanish Civil War was considered a God-ordained crusade against Spain's enemies of communism, liberalism, and democracy. So this really kind of changed how, um, how history was written, right? Um, one of, the, one of the texts that was taught a lot during the Franco years, and it's still taught today, but taught in kind of more propaganda reading of it is um, the epic poem El Cid, El Cid Campeador, the Cid the Champion. It's um, a medieval poem about um, this, this champion who goes on a quest um, throughout the country. Um, it precedes Don Quixote. And it was taught during the Franco years as like, look at this, this is where our national myth started. So again, trying to, point to a, a unified Spain, to a nation of Spain that had existed for centuries um, and rereading and reinterpreting the, the war as um, something of saving Spain or, you know, talking about how bad the, the Republicans were. So in the next two slides, I have examples from Franco's textbooks, which I think are really interesting. These are, if you, if you think of the context, these are young children who may have survived the war if they were a little older or were growing up during the dictatorship. And so regarding the coup, um, right, the, the rising of the Army of Africa in Morocco in 1936, um, the, the textbook says, the rising embodies the voice of honor, of freedom and of history. The Reds burn all the churches, kill all the clergy, kill hundreds of thousands of people and martyrize and burn them alive just because they don't think like them. So um, there's a lot of rhetoric in the first sentence in particular in terms of, um, the, the, the regime embodying honor, freedom, history, right, to preserve these noble pursuits of Spain, and then putting the blame all on the Reds or the Republicans, who of course, um, you know, they, they, it was a war, people, people killed um, people on both sides, but um, they're putting all of the blame on them as being the reason for these, these troubles in the country, right, um, and trying to kind of uh, right of it in a way that they're they're extremely br brutal and violent when it was really the nationalists who had more resources and and um, and um, defeated so many people right. Oh, I thought there was a yeah. There's another one after this. So um, so there's also to keep in mind the section femenina, the female section of the falange, right? If men were supportive of the military, then women grew um, up in, and as teenagers and young adults in the Seccion Femenina. This was founded by Pilar Primo de Rivera, who is the sister of um, Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, who founded the Falange, um, the Falange party, right? So she was in charge of, of kind of the control of women during this time period. And you see them on the right with their arms raised. The, the Seccion Femenina created schools and um, I get, yeah, schools, kind of education centers tailored towards um, young women, especially teenagers and young adults planning on um, soon getting married and having children. So it would teach them kind of those sorts of feminine pursuits, um, encourage them to do things like sewing or more traditional um, female arts and things of that nature. Um, 
and was very much centered on indoctrinating the woman to be the angel del hogar, the angel of the home, to be the, the good Spanish wife that we knew of in the 19th century. So being able to be submissive to her husband, um, to be always available to him, to serve her children and her household for the nation of Spain. And this was extremely important for them, for the regime, because there was um, a lot of loss of life with the war. Um, and they really, it was really vital that um, people had children um, immediately following the war to um, revitalize the population. So I have a, um, an excerpt from uh, the Seccion Femeninas magazine Medina from 1944. And it tells you a little bit about um, their values in terms of traditional gender roles of, of how they envision a woman's duty. So it says, the life of every woman is nothing more than an internal desire, eternal desire to find someone to submit herself to. Voluntary dependency, offering all her minutes, all her desires and illusions is the most beautiful state because it represents the absorption of all bad germs, vanity, egotism, frivolity by love. So um, as you can see in this, this um, statement, you know, they're looking for female abnegation. She submits herself, gives away all her desires and illusions. She's not a vain woman, right? All of these values that were important for um, becoming a, a good housewife um, to, to do as she's told, to follow, to fulfill her role to the regime. Um, and of course, it, it, um, those, those young girls who were reading this and, and being told this um, grew up to really question it once Franco died and kind of this reckoning in the 70s and 80s from those who, who lived during this time period of kind of thinking about what happened. Um, you know, they had a little bit of more, there was some sense of freedom built into the Seccion Femenina for some women who were able to do things like sports that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do or they were able to travel the country for re-education efforts and um, keeping in mind that rural areas um, had very little literacy. So they were able to do some things that they wouldn't originally been able to do in their families. And they, they speak of this in interviews. Um, but at the end of the day, this was a, a part of the regime, part of the Falange party um, and very much carried its values through it. So moving forward in time in early Francoism, we have, um, what's called prim, El Primer Franquismo or Early Francoism from the end of the war until around 1959. Um, in the 50s, Spain was able to receive support from the United States. This was extremely important. Um, the presidents of the time turned the tide. You see a picture of uh, Franco with Eisenhower. They embraced him. When Franco died, Nixon talked of how good of an ally he was to the United States. Um, Spain was finally able to join the UN after several failed attempts in 1955. And the key, um, key event of this period was the stabilization plan of 1959 and other plans that followed for rebuilding um, the, the, the war-torn nation. So this was a plan for economic growth and the end of autarky to seek help from other nations, to really devote the country to rapid industrialization, which led to a rise in migration to urban centers, which was depicted in some of the films of this time. Um, I also wanted to include a little bit about the, the Republican survivors. So for those who weren't in prison for those who didn't leave, what happened to them? They were what's called los topos or the moles. These were Spaniards who supported the Republic. Um, they may have supported other anti-fascist pursuits at that time. And so they hid from Franco's repression for over 30 years in some cases. They would hide in barns and small rooms of the houses um, and relied on family members to bring them food. Um, a very terrible way to live, but the only way they were able to survive. And there's some interesting um, videos on YouTube of, of people who emerged in the 70s um, and shared their story. The later years of the regime, um, what we think of as the tourist boom from 1959 until Franco's death in 1975, are what we call the segundo franquismo, so the second Francoism, or desarrollismo, or developmentalism. Um, these were years marked by a, a, a huge rise in tourism, emigration, strong industrial development, which, which fueled the consumer society and consumer economy like none before, and technocrats ran the government. So during the first years of the dictatorship, Franco relied on his closest allies to serve in government positions, but later would rely on technocrats who had um, college educations and were much more um, knowledgeable of how to run different aspects of the nation effectively when it came to the, um, to the economy. 
Um, there was also some opposition to the regime throughout this whole period, um, but not enough to really um, destroy it once and for all until Franco died. So there were worker strikes at this time as, um, as there was a rise in industry. There were a lot of university protests. These were um, struck down immediately with police brutality on those who were protesting. And there was also a, rise, a bit of a rise in regional nationalisms that were trying to hold on um, during this time period. And regional nationalisms of the um, Catalonia, Catalonia and the Basque country. Um, so now I'll move on to the, to the cultural side of things of the cultural production throughout the decades. Um, so what was culture like during Francoism? So popular culture by the regime, created by the regime, was used to maintain power and control over the population. We have to keep in mind how long standing this regime was and how many, I, I, I often told my students how many generations were affected. We you keep that in mind because the young adults who lived during the, during the war and dictatorship lived through the whole regime um, as, as well as their parents lived through much of it. So many generations were, were affected. It's only kind of the millennial generation of those 40 and under who no longer had lived under this regime. So Francoism used seemingly innocuous cultural tools such as music, film, magazines, romance novels, comics to create a system of behavior based on the model of the ideal Spanish society produced by the regime. Um, to give an example in comics, there were a lot of comics during that time that depicted strong champions like the Cid Campeador that I mentioned, these strong brawny guys who were saving the, the nation. That was kind of what was mainly depicted in comics. Um, um, and, you, and you see on the top right is a picture, a screenshot of Nodo, Noticias en Documentales, which are the, the news and documentaries. That was the huge um, media apparatus of the regime. So they would create um, newsreels as well as documentaries about, look how great we're doing with the economy, look at um, you know, different cultural things. It branched out to include more genres and more topics later on, but it was very much focused on giving news um, to the population by being shown before, um, before a film. And Franco as a figure is, of course, very much present in the minds of modern of, of Spaniards nowadays for both for those who still support him and for those who are vehemently against the regime. So we'll start with the 1940s and 50s for the post-war and early Francoism, and I have mostly examples from the 1940s. So I'll begin by, with um, Raza, which is actually a film written by Francisco Franco. So it's a really interesting sort of cultural text that I use in my class um, because Franco was, he wrote the screenplay. He was um, very closely involved in the project. And what it comes down to is being a very propaganda based film. It had a really big budget um, and, and they invested a lot of money in it and it was shown Many times Franco would watch it like every week. Um, he was extremely proud of this film. And it kind of depicts what they, depicts their idea of what a good Spanish family should be doing. So I think this excerpt from the screenplay kind of is at the beginning of what you will see in the movie, right? Um, kind of illustrates what they're, where they're going with this film. So, so they say, you will experience scenes of the life of a generation, unedited episodes of the Spanish crusade, headed by the nobility and spirituality of our race. An aristocratic family is the center of this work. An accurate picture of the Spanish families that have resisted the hardest onslaughts of materialism. Sublime sacrifices, heroic feats, and acts of high nobility will parade before your eyes. Um, so taking a look at that title, raza, right, race. Race for them meant this Spanish race, the Spanish nation, thinking of Spain as a nation that has um, deep roots from medieval times until today. You see the um, the lion and the outline there on the the um, poster from their um, from um, Castilla y Leon, the the region um, where the monarchy is. Um, and and what it's saying here, right? The Spanish Crusade. Um, so what the movie depicts a family. It starts off in the late 1900s, sorry, late 1800s in the 19th century um, with a family who whose father um, had fought um, to try to maintain those, those final colonies. Um, and he's talking to his little children about the sacrifices they must make and the noble death they must have for the nation, right? So he's, he's telling his children this. And then we fast forward a couple decades and the children are all grown up and each of them kind of teaches us a different lesson about how to be a loyal servant to the, to the regime. So one becomes a priest, one becomes um, a soldier, 
one um, actually supports um, the Republicans and then later redeems himself through a noble act. And then the, the, the daughter who supports her brothers and her husband. Um, so it kind of exemplifies what they imagine the family should be doing during this time period. And again, it was, it was played many times um, by Franco. In contrast, I have an example of a poem by Damaso Alonso. He was one of the men I, I showed in the picture at the beginning that I, I use in my project. Um, a lot of the poetry, even by those who didn't support the regime at the time, and, and that's mostly what I study, right? The um, 30s and 40s poetry, a lot of it doesn't say much about the war or dictatorship, and it doesn't point to it exactly, but it's still there in the poems. But Damaso Alonso does give us a little bit of insight into what it was like during this time. So this is from his collection, Hijos de la Ira, or, or, or Sons of, of Agony, Sons of Fury. Um, and the poem is called Insomnia. It was written in 1944. So this is a man who's around 45 or so years of age. So have a middle-aged man experiencing the, the horrors of the war and dictatorship firsthand. So this, this is the poem that begins the collection and it, it very much kind of um, exemplifies what people are experiencing even if it wasn't written about or talked about much. So he begins by saying in Insomnia, Madrid is a city of more than a million corpses, according to the latest statistics. Sometimes at night I stir and go back to the niche where I have been rotting for 45 years. And I spend long nights listening to the cry of the hurricane or dogs barking or the soft flow of moonlight. And then it, it, I skip forward and, and translated this next part. I spend long hours asking God why my soul is slowly rotting, why more than a million corpses are rotting in this city why a billion corpses are slowly rotting on this earth. So he's, so he's asking why he's depicting this bleak landscape, this huge amount of death and destruction that followed the war. But he's older, he's, he, he's too weary of these things, right? He's, he's listening to this and he's, he's just thinking, why is there so much senseless destruction, so much rot, um, decay? Um, these poets were reaching middle age at the time, so they weren't, seeing things in the same way as, as um, younger generations would. They, they were there firsthand and, and um, somehow made it, made it through the dictatorship alive. But um, yeah, the this, 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 this striking sense of giving us the statistics of how much death there has been, um, I think is really profound here. So this is from his collection, Hijos de la Ira, or, or Sons of the Fury, if you're, if you're interested. I imagine there's some translations available, but I just, for the sake of time, translate this passage um, since I didn't have a translation on me. Um, another really important text, this was this was extremely um, well known um, at the time, is Carmen Laforet's novel Nada or Nothing. Um, her novel is um, was published, sorry, it was awarded the Premio Nadal, which is a huge prestigious award in, at the end of 1944 and was published in 1945. So Carmen Laforet, um, she had a whole lifelong career of being a writer. She was only in her early 20s when she wrote this. And this book is, um, an, is the, the um, protagonist Andrea's account of a year attending university in Barcelona after the Spanish Civil War. Um, and it kind of is following the footsteps of Laforet herself. She was in university during the early 40s. And so this is only kind of a few years after her own um, time there. Um, Andrea had been living in the Canary Islands, and so she wasn't, she, she knew there was a war, but she didn't experience it the same way as someone living in Barcelona would, right? So she arrives in Barcelona as a young woman, unaware of the world and completely unaware of how to live in a city, um, and she lives with her very dysfunctional family in this little apartment, and we see firsthand her accounts of you know, first her freedom and then kind of her frustration trying to survive here. So um, so I, I have here the question, how do people survive in ruined cities? This is something I asked myself in my own scholarship for, for reading these novels. How are people finding means of survival um, against the, you know, the, the oppression and the um, lack of resources and infrastructure of the regime? So how do people deal with this infrastructure failure um, both in, on an artistic level and practical level through these depictions. Um, and also have your um, censorship in post-war. So there was a huge apparatus of censorship following the war. However, the people, the censors 
a lot of things got through. The censors weren't able to really read the poems, some of them carefully enough to really um, decide whether or not they were, um, were dangerous. So it was a little bit um, all over the place in terms of what got through, but there certainly was censorship. Um, poetry was a little easier. Um, but in light of that, a lot of books were published in Mexico and um, Buenos Aires, Argentina during this time period. And that was how a lot of Spanish literature um, came through during this period. Um, so we'll move on to the 1960s and the tourist boom. So this was this was a time of, um, of excitement of a little bit more prosperity because um, everyday Spaniards were able to afford more um, um, consumer products. They were able to have a car, they were able to go on vacation and do things that they weren't able to do before. Um, so this first film is called An Angel Has Arrived. And this is one that's in favor of the regime, but it's kind of showing us the more innocuous side of things. So this is a young woman named Marisol. Um, she's the star of the film and she starred in a couple other films. As you can see in the picture, she was doing flamenco inspired dances and songs throughout the film. So it's a, um, it's a musical film and it's really fun, um, really high energy. She really does a great job acting. And so we watched this in my class and, and you know, the students and I were thinking about how enjoyable it is watching her performance, um, watching the others sing and dance, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fun, right? But at the same time, below the surface, um, a lot of what she's saying to her family, so she's a young girl and she um, has been recently orphaned and has to move to Madrid to be with her relatives who she hasn't really met before or, you know, when she was really little. So um, she is the angel there to redeem them essentially. So all of her family members have vices. Um, you know, one of them's lazy, doesn't want to get a job. And so she drags him to the car repair shop. And he'd been, uh, he'd been like a, um, he'd, doing, he'd been doing a lot of weightlifting. And so she's like, oh, well, you could go to the car shop and you can help with the cars. You're really strong, you know? So finding more acceptable outlets for people to um, work um, and, and be valuable to the regime is kind of her role to make these people have a good, good, um, influence in society. But again, it's a really fun film. Flamenco dancing and inspired songs were really um, important during this period to carry um, those, those sorts of movies and um, other sorts of programs, cultural programs. Um, so, so we talked in my class about um, the use of flamenco there. Um, and then going back to the tourist boom, right? Um, tourism sort of was happening in the 50s. And then it really increased to the 60s. And by 1975, Spain had 30 million visitors. So um, this was in part thanks to the rise in industry, consumer economy, as well as propaganda, or not propaganda, but like travel posters to, to encourage people to come, right? Um, so um, all of these travel posters had different slogans. Um, the main slogans were things like, Spain is beautiful and different, visit Spain. Um, and all of these have kind of different variations of that, of course, in English to try to attract tourists and they would get tours from all over Europe, um, especially during this time period and, and kind of showing what Spain is and their, their vision of Spain, what they wanted to kind of portray to, to potential tourists was to show its, its deep historical roots. It's a medieval past, um, these old towns, you know, you see a cathedral and clock tower, you see these old kind of fort fortifications you see these beautiful, you know, streets in Madrid, right? You see these sorts of structures, and, and you want to visit these historical sites. So um, I have here. It's a it's a very short clip. It's not subtitled, but um, I think you know the mo main thing is is looking at the images here. This is from kind of this is kind of a narration of um, tourism, how it got started. And so we'll see kind of people traveling to Spain with their little RVs or large cars um, in this clip. So I, I, I changed the setting so you should be able to hear it and hopefully that's true. Estamos en la estación de Irún. Desde el otro lado de la frontera afluyen a España turistas de todos los países ávidos de nuestras oleadas costas. Es el sol español, es el sol español, es el sol español. El turismo, propiamente dicho, llega a España a partir de los años 50. 
Tras la Segunda Guerra Mundial, la economía de los países combatientes despega. Se forma una clase media europea que junto al desarrollo de los transportes y el mal clima de sus lugares de origen, provoca la afluencia de visitantes a la exótica y barata España. Oiga, turista, la punta de la lanza del Cid Campeador es la auténtica, la quiere. ¿El Cid Campeón? El campeón es usted. Tú en ti, regalado en cualquier museo. All right, so so we saw, you know, a lot of European countries had um, had economic prosperity and a rise of the middle class following World War II. So there was a there was a big push for tourism, and Spain certainly welcomed it. And they did so by kind of portraying the country um, as being very exotic, as being different, as being kind of this other in terms of its culture. And this was a myth that was was propagated over the centuries of Spain being different from the rest of Europe. In some places. Um, or in, in some context, it was kind of thought that Africa begins at the Pyrenees, right? Implying that, you know, Spain is, is separate from the rest of Europe. All right, so, so in the 1960s, um, quite a few films depicted these, these, this rise in tourism. The one on the left is actually a short, I believe it's from 2014, so a recent short. And this short film is called Bikini. And, and we watched it because um, what it is, it's, a, it's about a 15 minute segment in which, um, one of the um, the um, politicians in a small um, seaside community, he's trying to pitch to Franco the idea that women should be able to wear bikinis because that's what the tourists are doing. And if we do this, more tourists will come and ultimately we wanna you know, revitalize the economy. And so it's a really interesting back and forth between the people depicting Franco and his wife, wife Carmen Polo and the um, politicians, so it's kind of, based on a true story, right? Kind of thinking about why did Franco allow women to wear these skimpy bikinis? And the reason was ultimately for, for economic purposes of being able to attract tourists. Um, but that being said, those who were Spanish didn't necessarily get the same treatment or, or um, ability to, or freedoms as, as the tourists were able to do at some of these seaside communities. You know, some of these communities were very welcoming to the LGBT community for those who were coming from other countries. And Spaniards weren't able to really find those same enclaves um, for, for the sort of sexual freedom or, or just you know freedom of expression. And you see on this movie poster for Bikini, the, um, the shadow on the ground is the shadow of the, um, the falange, the, the, the image of the regime, right? So he's on a Vespa trying to go meet up with Franco and then we see this, this woman in a bikini. So it's an interesting short. The film that was created at the time is Viva Los Novios or Long Live the um, Bride and Groom. It's a dark comedy. Um, and what it really does a good job of doing is depicting this clash of cultures between the Spaniards who'd been sequestered and culturally isolated for decades and the tourists who had been keeping up with the trends and keeping up with you know, the Eurovision Music Festival and all that stuff. Um, the, the man who's the, the groom, he, they're, they're, they're both a little older. I think they're around 40. So you know, it's a little old for them to be getting married. Um, and before he gets married, um, he is just trying to sneak off with all the foreign women and he's being, um, you know, very voyeuristic and he gets into all these goofy situations. Um, so again, it depicts that kind of juxtaposition of the, of the Spanish man and, um, and the, the kind of cultural isolation of the seaside town. And then what's coming in with the tourists, right? The, the wife, his, his bride, um, she works in a souvenir shop. And so there's all these like inflatable pool floaties and things like that around. So moving forward in time now to the 1970s. So this is um, what we call the transition is the transition to democracy. Um, and a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate as to when it got started um, and, and its development. It was very nonlinear and a bit messy at times. So the end of the dictatorship ultimately came with the death of Franco. He was ill and aging, so you know it was no surprise to anyone that th that things were slowly coming to an end. I, I think he was in his 80s, I believe. He he lived um, into his 80s, so knowing that he was you know getting old, the regime named or he named Luis Carrero Blanco as his successor. And what happened was Luis Carrero Blanco was assassinated in 1973 by ETA. That's the Basque terrorist organization. His car was blown up. It was horrific, and and there's a, it was caught on on tape on um, what happened. So, he was killed. He was out of the picture, and 
Franco did name someone else as head of the government near the time of his death, but nothing was certain. Um, there was a climate of huge uncertainty at the time of his death because there was no real successor. He was adamant about having someone to carry on his legacy and that didn't happen. So Franco died um, because of many illnesses related to aging. He um, was hospitalized for a time and ultimately died um, after many surgeries in the attempt to save him. So he died in November of 1975. And that's really when um, the push for the transition got started. So I'll, talk, I'll pause there and, and talk about this, um, this text before we move on to kind of what happened with the transition. So um, if, if you're interested in, in writing from this time period, Carmen Martin Gaite, she was a young woman during the beginning of the dictatorship. She was only a teenager. So kind of that target demographic for indoctrinating young, young adults, young children. Um, and she wrote, um, she's written quite a few novels. Some of the most relevant are Usos Amorosos de la Posguerra. So like, it's kind of like a anthropological study of young, young love, young adults during the post-war period. And she has this for different other periods in Spain. And she also wrote El Cuarto de Atrás, which is um, called The Back Room. So her work recounts the Francoist ideal of the Spanish woman and her kind of difficulties and and wrestling with the, what, what that means for her. Um, she talks in, in the back room at Cuarto de Atras about how she was about the same age as Franco's own daughter and kind of paralleling her life to the public figure that was um, his Carmencita Franco, right? Um, she also um, talks about Spanish cultural isolation, how she learned of Spanish heroism in school. And it's a very fragmented narrative, that novel, kind of thinking about her memories and what she experienced at the time until where she is now in the 1970s as a woman who has a family um, and again reckoning with the, these cultural changes and what she actually wants for herself in her life and how she kind of managed to survive through this imaginary space or world of the back room. So moving forward in time for after the dictatorship and then we'll get to the transition. Sorry, I was confused about the order. So, so ghosts of the dictatorship are, are, are still relevant and still around in Spain. So in my in the field of Iberian studies or Spanish cultural studies that I'm in, we talk a lot about memory studies and ghosts and what um, what remains of the dictatorship. So I have here two examples of films that depict this. So the first is 1976 Carlos Saura's Cria Cuervos, Raise, Raise, Raise Ravens. Um, and it's about a young girl. She's lost her mother um, and she's being raised by her father and a, and a stepmother and kind of her experiences growing up. And it's narrated, and keep in mind it was filmed in 1976, it's narrated by an adult version of her in the 90s. So the 90s hadn't happened yet, but she's they're kind of projecting forward in time how she's remembering this period. This is happening right on the heels of the death of Franco when things will be changing, kind of imagining how this, this girl will exist as a young adult in the 90s and, and talking her talking about her childhood. On a second film, um, which I know is available in English, is Guillermo del Toro's The Devil's Backbone. He's done quite a few films depicting the war or kind of more allegorical representations of the war. This is from 2001. Um, it's it's a horror film. It's a little bit scary at times because there, there are actual ghosts in it. Um, and it's centered around this, this town that has a bomb that has been placed in the center of it. It hasn't exploded, nothing's happened. Um, but weird things happen in this place. Um, and he kind of, even though we don't, he doesn't mention the war specifically, there's a sense that this is happening. This is placed during the war. And there are also many novels as well, but I think the films have had more of an impact culturally. Um, so the transition to democracy around 1975, but again, it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, so I wanted to focus on specific laws that are being, are being passed and what's happening today. So the amnesty law of 1977, that's what really ensured a peaceful transition to democracy. And as I say that, there was also an attempted coup around that time. So things were not very, you know, left very certain. However, those who supported Franco basically with no protest um, left and um, ultimately Franco's supporters voted only a few percent um, in the first democratic election. So Adolfo Suarez was elected as um, prime minister um, this amnesty law is, is um, 
um, infamous because what happened was it gave an amnesty to everyone. It gave amnesty to prisoners of Francoism and those who um, had been brutally oppressed during the time. And it gave amnesty to those who tortured them and committed these um, acts, of human rights violations, right? Um, as a result, there have been ongoing international trials seeking to seeking justice, right, at a legal level for these people. Um, it's been very um, well broadcast in the news in the past few years because this is an aging population. Um, and this demographic is really trying to do all they can while they can um, to make things happen. What's tricky is because of these laws, um, they can't just use a Spanish judge to adjudicate the case. They need to go, um, there's, a, there's a particular judge in Argentina that's been helping with these cases, um, as, is, as is typical for human rights violation cases to have to go to a different country um, to, to deal with that. So it's very complicated. And there was finally a new constitution instated in 1978, which remains active today with of course some amendments and things, um, but finally a constitution after over 40 years. More recent laws. Um, so this is the most recent law that has passed, but there's one that's in the process. So this is the historical memory law of 2007. Um, it does a little bit of a better job, but there's still you know, um, some difficulties here. So the law recognizes the victims of the civil war and dictatorship and ultimately condemns the regime. So much more straightforward, not just, you know, leaving the, leaving the past in the past, right? So the amnesty law was kind of conflated with this idea of amnesia, right? Amnistia, amnesia, right? Very close together word-wise. The historical memory law seeks to rectify some of that. Um, they created a general archive of the Spanish civil war in Salamanca as kind of like these official records of the war. I haven't actually visited that one, um, but it, again, very official sort of national archive created. Um, this was also around the time when exhumations and identification of victims increased um, and, incre and, and there was a heightened interest in it because keep in mind that the, the grandchild's gaze are these young adults who are, who are now, you know, growing up in democracy. They're in their 20s and 30s and they're wondering what happened to their to their um, to their relatives, some, you know, their their grandparents for some, or a great uncle or something like that, trying to figure out what happened. And finally, this law granted Spanish nationality to international brigade members. Next, we have this new historical memory law that is right in the process of potentially being passed. Um, it's being debated right now. Um, and some of the things that it would do if passed, and of course, I imagine these would change as their, as debates are ongoing, it would void Franco's trials um, during that time period, right? So these, um, as being part of the human rights violations, um, it would provide public funding for around four to five years for identifying and recovering bodies from mass graves. So making a bigger push and again, providing public funding, which hadn't been done before. Very important, they would change how students learn about the war in Francoism in schools. These are topics that are talked about today and touched upon in schools, but not very much. And there's very much room for improvement in how students learn about these time periods um, instead of skipping over it. Um, very different from how children learn about um, the Holocaust in Germany, for example. Finally, um, due to the passage of time, eligibility for Spanish citizenship, citizenship no longer for the International Brigade, as many have pretty much all have died, but rather for their descendants possible Spanish citizenship. And Spanish citizenship as an aside exists for those who can trace their um, Jewish, Jewish ancestry to Spain. You're able to take a Spanish profici proficiency test and provide evidence of your heritage going back to when um, Muslims and Jews were um, expelled from Spain at the end of the 15th century. Continuing to think about memory, right? We saw the vi Valley of the Fallen last time around. Um, the, the, the memory of Spain in the war, what, what happens to it? What are we doing with the dictatorship? Um, it, it belongs in the collective memory of many communities around the world, right? This has touched Spain, US, Europe, Latin America, and so much is still unresolved to this day. So I'll just end by um, showing these pictures of an Abraham Lincoln Brigade monument in San Francisco in 2008. So you can see there's these little um, boxes with, with information about the brigade and these people. All right, so we'll start a question and answer session now. I think we're right at 11 o'clock. So I'll let you guys ask any questions you have. Um, Angela, 
Um, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, your presentations have been terrific. For those, for those of you who don't know this, um, Angela has done a lot of writing on some of these issues, and she has shared with me those, um, those, those writings that she authored. And if you're interested in reading them, please contact me because I have a whole bunch of them, um, which I have read um, most of them. And she is just a terrific writer. And what I really want to do is say two things. One, you may be moving to Texas, but we're not going to lose you. Um, I intend to chase you there and have you do additional presentations, um, especially on Spanish culture, which is your field of expertise. Um, and I want to wish you the best, best of luck, but I know you're not going to have any problems in converting your ABD status to a PhD. Um, and I wanna tell you, I think we're all rooting for you, but I know you'll do stellar in uh, writing and defending your dissertation. And with that, um, I will open the floor to questions. Uh, I have the same question that Walter Wynn does, that uh, you did not mention the king and the trans and Franco's opening up to uh, the moniker coming back in. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so I was, thank you for that question because I was running a little bit out of time and I didn't quite have a lot about the transition just to kind of focus on the preceding years. Yeah, so um, the, the King Juan Carlos had been in power. Um, Franco had chosen him during his, his regime um, following Alfonso the 13th. And so um, Juan Carlos was in power during and following his death. And then um, we now have um, a new king in powers as of a couple years ago. But um, again, yes, he, he was in control of the monarchy, which is the reason why those who supported the Carlists supported the regime because they um, were in favor of the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy, which is what happened. And why did, uh, why did Franco bring back the king or the monarchy, I should say? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that has to, I, I'm not too familiar I'm with, with the monarchy itself in that aspect of Spanish history, mostly because I, I grew up in the US. And um, so I'm not quite sure. I think the main reason had to do with reestablishing Spain as a nation and its continuity there um, through the monarchy and, and the um, power both as a figurehead and through um, different um, groups that supported him. It was, it was a good move. Mm -hmm. Uh, Angela, I'd like to flash back to 1953. You mentioned uh, and showed the picture of uh, President Eisenhower and Franco. The uh, main U.S. economic support, as I understand it, starting in 1953, was the uh, Spanish U.S. bases program, where we built major military bases in Spain. Um, was there any other uh, aspect of this economic assistance and from 53 that you know of beside the Spanish basis program? Yeah, good question. I'm not quite sure since again, this isn't, I'm, I'm more focused on cultural production. So I'm not quite sure, but I imagine there were other incentives um, built into that is my thought, but I'm not, I'm not sure of any other examples. Well, that program was huge. The Navy executed that and uh, built major uh, bases in Zaragoza, Torajon, Moron, mm -hmm. and Rota, and also uh, renovated a number of Spanish uh, small bases that were used historically there in Spain. One of those small bases uh, up on the Northwest Cape between uh, France and Portugal was El Farol. And uh, having visited that and inspected the work back in the late 50s, I was uh, reminded that that fuel depot there had been used to uh, fueled German submarines during World War II. And now here was the Americans rehabbing that uh, for use by Spain. But anyway, uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Yeah, thank and thank you for sharing. Any other questions for Angela? Yeah, Angela. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. 
uh, one of the critical aspects of the monarchy was, I think it was about 1975, uh, when the military insurrectionists attempted to uh, take over parliament. And yeah, I think that was 77 or 78, yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, and Juan Carlos was uh, uh, very uh, uh, instrumental in uh, seeing that that was defeated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and being you know such a recent thing, there there is it's on film. You know this 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 scare of of someone infiltrating parliament, um, and and so yeah, so so again the transition being marked by a lot of uncertainty, um, but ultimately moving forward, um, there were there was a whole generation of these young politicians, um, Alfonso Suarez. You have um, um, more socialist leaning. Um, politicians who were able to become prime ministers um, and kind of steer the nation in a different direction. Um, aside from the political side of the transition, um, I didn't mention the cultural um, movida, um, the movida madrileña of all of these, um, you know, counterculture movements of the 70s and 80s of a young generation trying to finally find freedom through things like punk rock, um, experimental, um, if you're familiar with the um, film, Spanish filmmaker Almodovar, um, he depicts this in his own films and through his own life experiences. So it's kind of a way of, of finding oneself at a time, during a time of much uncertainty about the future. Angela, do you find uh, young people your age who, who still are Franco supporters? Yeah, so there are Franco supporters who are of a younger demographic, and I think what's challenging there is, you know, people under 40 did not experience this firsthand, and they have a very much more ideological or idealistic way of looking at Franco. A lot of the rhetoric, it's really weird because a lot of the rhetoric is around, you know, um, recess, uh, you know, Franco being uh, brought back to life and saving the nation and all this stuff, and they really their interest in Francoism is specifically about Franco and about what he represents um, and about that sort of military masculine might is, is what people kind of lean towards. Um, and so there are some fanatics and supporters, especially men um, who turn to that um, more um, military side of his, his life. Um, and of course there are women who support the regime too. Um, and a lot, but a lot of the supporters live during the time period. So, you know, a demographic of, of 60 and older, but I think the women who turn towards it are more for the conservative Catholic traditional values, whereas men are looking more towards the, um, the figurehead of the Caudillo or Generalissimo. Mm -hmm. Okay, Is, if there are not any more questions, uh, we'll let Angela get back to work. Um, and we thank her again for her outstanding presentations. And we look forward to hearing from her again. Thank you very much, Angela. And thank, thank you. you for having me. It's